Christine Whitcraft. remember nothing else from what I say tonight. Uh, the big point is that I'm incredibly honored to be the 2022 WSM president. It's both humbling for the people who have been that before, and it's exciting for those that we just picked to be the next two. So I had no idea what to stand up in front of you and talk about. So I asked a couple colleagues. You'll be glad to know I chose almost none of their responses. <laughs> uh, sorry, Kevin. <laughs> There was a suggestion that I get my lab to sing to Baby Shark. Shark lab injected. There was also an option that I just walk up and sort of do a mic drop like it was the correspondence dinner and then leave. I decided I wasn't that president either. But what I did do was to take the other questions that I asked and put them together in a talk. And part of it started with the idea of why we're all here, right? So it's been two years since we had an in-person meeting. We had two virtual ones. They were some great science that was shared, but we all felt like something was missing, right? And we're so excited to be back together in person. And so I started thinking about why that was, right? And it's partially because we're here to share our science and why we're a scientist with each other as a community, right? We didn't, you know, science in a bubble isn't good science. It doesn't help our fellow scientists. It doesn't help our communities. And we heard that in our talks today. So I started thinking about why I became a scientist. It's about week 10 or 11 in the semester. And I realized why I didn't become a scientist, right? All of you have been there. It wasn't any of this, right? And we have great WSN mentors that says it's not for the paperwork. I don't know what Paul Dayton is doing in this picture, but I know that the next picture I had was his head down on the table. And so when I ruled out why I wasn't a scientist as I filled out my travel form to come to WSN, I thought about why I was. And some of it starts with terrible 70s clothing but the opportunity and the privilege to get outside. <laughs> and I don't usually give a career advice because I think everyone's path gets you to a different place. But the one piece I usually say is remember why you started doing what you do and see if you can still do it for your real job. That's not Yoda, that's my child also. <laughs> I don't know why he looks like Yoda, but I do the same thing as a child that I do now. And not everyone can say that, right? And, you know, I then, so I was interested in buckets and dirt when I was a child. I still have that as a job, but it also took people to tell me that that was a job and to tell me that that was okay or normal or semi-normal, right? Um, and so a big reason that I'm still a scientist is because of other people, right? My parents actually hate the beach, so that part of science they don't understand. My dad thinks there's too many people. It brings sand in the car. My mom thinks salt water is itchy. <laughs> but they did say that it was okay that I liked science in the beach. Um, my husband is also an oceanographer, though he thinks that we could just collect the whole marsh in one bucket and bring it back because that would optimize the time. <laughs> that said, he is great in the field. Um, but I also had people who then told me that, you know, carrying buckets around was science, and they became the mentors we hear about. My undergrad advisor was Jim Carlton, who is such a big name in invasion biology, but answers my emails in the same day. I don't even answer 
my husband in the same day. And he answers my emails years later. And the best career advice he gave me was find something little that no one else studies and understand it more than anyone else does. So I count Liga Keats, right? <laughs> Um, I also had, and you already heard about her this morning, my PhD advisor was Lisa Levin, who was our Lifetime Achievement Award winner. Um, and she, I asked her, why did you do science? And she said, because I love submersing myself in nature, both figuratively and literally. And that's a typical of her mentorship style too. She also answers emails in the same day. She clears her inbox of all the options of the papers she has to review, etc but she immerses herself in what she's doing, making her the mentor that told me I could too. My academic grandfather was Paul Dayton, who took me into under his wing, also showed me how to get muddy, um, and also taught me how to instill a love of natural history in students. None of that is done without your lab mates and your grad student companions, many of whom are the reason that I come to WSN. After I graduated from grad school, I did a postdoc with Drew Talley, who's here, um, who, when I asked him why he did science, said, I love sharing places that I love with my students. It's, I liken it to having a song or movie you love and how much fun it is to share with others, which is exactly why we're here. And we heard in many talks today about instilling that love of the environment in students in places that we care about, like Baja. Jeff Crooks also answered my plea and sent me a very similar picture from the 70s, I think, of him in Mission Bay, where he said that, you know, the theme was he's always wanted to be a marine biologist and was supported by a cast of family, friends, colleagues, and advisors that told him he could protect the places he cares about. I also then thought about, well, those were all very top-down examples of mentorship, but I'm a bottom-up scientist. I take the oligarchies and I study bottom-up. And then I realized that my students mentor me every day. From uh, learning the eye distance that we all have in our microscopes, because I can't see from some of my students, the head goes right between the eyepieces, <laughs> and realizing that I have to say, you should be able to see both. And you know that's teaching me how to teach. But also just to the point of, um, you know you have a task in the field that you really dislike. For me, it's sort of, we have a vacuum, a bug sucker, and we suck bugs off of plants. It really bothers me. I don't like it. My students think it's so cool. So they teach me to find the joy in what we do every day. And part of that was sharing the WSN community with them, which is another reason we come back. I want all of us, when we come to this community, to feel the excitement that Molly clearly feels about whatever's about to happen in that picture. <laughs> But it's also the place where I learned how to run a meeting from when the CSULB was a, the secretariat. It's also where I came to my first meeting with my son and Sean Anderson took that picture with some sort of fisheye lens. You're welcome. Um, of how to bring your infant to a meeting and still run student judging kind of thing. Um, I also learned new colleagues here. You know, Jan and I recently started working together and she was in our plenary symposium this morning but I also then reconnected with the, the classmates that you guys saw in my lab pictures. So Bonnie and Tanya and Chris, who are all still here. And so I became a scientist to help save the places I cared about, but it was facilitated by people. So I thought, why well, I already asked a lot of cool people why they were scientists, I'll just keep asking. I wanna know why others became scientists. I love that, Al. So I sent a whole bunch of emails and about, I would say, 40 people answered me. My question was, what is your science? Why? You can both read their words or listen to mine, but uh, Tanya told me that the most impactful part of the job is helping students to change their perspective. Chris told me three answers. He said that it was for the toys, <laughs> but also for the students and also for the sunsets, which have been on display here where we can look across the Channel Islands. Other colleagues at CSULB told me that they had amazing mentors. Erica Holland said she was fascinated by Jane Goodall and just like me, believed that could be a career because someone told her it could be. Gwen goodman Lowe, who's also at Cal State Long Beach and just retired, told me that it was growing up in the coast where marine mammals were visible um, and deciding that that was um, what she wanted to do as she was a marine biologist. 
I also talk to colleagues that I work with who I didn't, you know, have in every day. When your work view is this, it's not so bad. And you never know what place in the coast you're going to get to work in. This was it. Eric Zahn, who's alum of our program and a um, co-founder of a consulting company. Some people I asked are way funnier than I and love movies. And they told me that the best thing about science is you get to be a total goofball and let your imagine run imagination run wild and you can envision that you're a uh, movie, a superhero scientist. Uh, former students from Cal State Long Beach find that sort of recreational and spiritual connection and they want their ocean environments to be healthy enough to preserve that. Another former student told me that it was all about inspiring her uh, nephew in this picture. I also don't know quite what's going on. Um, <laughs> but about preserving the livable world um, to establish that relationship we were all so excited about having. Other students have gone on to work in resource management where they can, management, where they can advocate for natural landscapes and for processes that can't advocate for themselves. Some of it was that they loved to teach environmental science and biology and teaching kids to become science nerds while also flying in helicopters, which was pretty cool, she said. <laughs> Other former students talked about um, the why being someone who told them when they were young, again, that this was what you could do, that you had an enthusiasm for the natural world, that they had amazing teachers and mentors, whether it was father figures or AP biology teachers, that also showed them which, that these were careers. Another former student said that her why is being able to work together with people committed to making a difference. It makes late night field work worthwhile. Apparently my lab works at sunset as well, or sunrise, depending on. <laughs> um, there is a certain amount of uh, emails that I got back that told me that falling in the mud was a real joy of what they found, and I think maybe that's self-selecting. Rodrigo, <laughs> Rodrigo may not share that joy yet. Um, but a current student told me that she really not only loves to fall in the mud, but also how to make that enjoyable for others to make a difference. Sebastian, who you heard talk today, is a current student and says like he feels joy when he's in the field. Um, it's connection to nature and a better understanding of ecosystems that makes it possible. The current master's student who works on Ridgeway Rails sees that they can make an impact together on those ecosystems that are most imperiled, like the light-footed Ridgeway Rail habitat. Um, a former student who presented here today said that, you know, we as humans have the imagination, drive, and tenacity to grow with the living creatures that we study, crawling all around the planet. Slightly creepy image of us crawling all around the planet, but I liked it. Um, a former undergraduate of mine, who's now a graduate student in Danielle Zacharel's lab at Fullerton, says that developing solutions to environmental problems that take humans into account creates greater interest and participation. And that if we alienate people, it will make them resilient to change, which I felt like she might have looked at our script for translational ecology and <laughs> provided me with notes. Alyssa, who's a master's student in my lab and did a poster here, had another fantastic mentor that really helped her to decide she wanted to do research. I borrowed Danielle's students a lot. Brandon wrote back that the outreach he does, the local communities and the mentoring of historically excluded students give him the why he has in science. And another student who couldn't be here today but sent me one of the amazing pictures was really focused on the why is making a difference. So for me, I could have shown you a graph that said that all of us fell into the three categories of having amazing mentors that told us we could make a difference while saving the places we loved. Instead, that was better than a graph, right? <laughs> so I learned from all of your whys that I'm in good company. Doesn't advance. We became scientists because of the family, maybe because of the mentors, both top-down and bottom-up mentors, because of the passion we had for the environment, because of the awe that we had, because of our advocacy. But we did it because we were surrounded by an environment that we cared about, because we realized that the future wasn't just ours,
And last, because of the communities we make in meetings like this. So thank you for coming. That is all I have for you guys. And uh, I'm super honored to be your president for this year.